Welcome. So welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. It's the second week of our new venue. So it's my honor today to introduce Dr. Robert Green. Dr. Green is a medical geneticist and a physician scientist who directs the G2P Genomes to People Research Program in Translational Genomics in the Division of Genetics at Brigham and Women's and HMS. So Dr. Green is a principal investigator on several NIH-funded studies that focus on translational genomics, um, which studied the impact of the use of genomic sequencing technologies in patient care. And I'll just highlight a few of these um, studies and the questions they ask, including the PGEN study, which is one of the first prospective studies of direct-to-consumer genetic testing services. And Dr. Green also leads the MedSeq project, which evaluates the use of whole genome sequencing in the clinical practice of medicine and co-directs the BabySeq project, which is the first NIH-funded trial of sequencing in newborns. And both of the latter two studies really highlight um, the use of uh, genomic sequencing, both in patients who have um, hereditary disease as well as those who are healthy, so in order to study the downstream impact on health behavior and healthcare costs. So we're very excited to have Dr. Green here today to discuss the important questions of if and when we should be sequencing our patients. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's a particular honor to be here because I trained in the Brigham not once but twice, 25 years apart, first in neurology and then in medical genetics. And I'm really delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have the support of Dr. Lascalzo and Dr. Moss in this sort of renewal of my career around genomics. Um, I do want to disclose my funding sources my advisory, compensated advisory roles, and I have co-founded a company which does telemedicine for genomics expertise. Um, the program that I'm going to describe today conducts implementation science in genomics, essentially the medical, behavioral, and economic impact of using genomics inside and outside the healthcare system. And it's actually a very small program. We have 25 or 30 core people. But what we, how we operate is sort of like a, a film company in the sense that when we uh, create a product or, or a project, we then outsource partnerships with lots of investigators around the country. So for example, we name each one of our programs and uh, each one has a, has a group of people who come together from all around the country to work on it. So this is, for example, our NIH-funded people seek study, and you can see the people in the circles are the core members of the G2P program. Or here in our PopSeq program, our newest one, looking at sequencing return of results and penetrance in the Framingham Heart Study and the Jackson Heart Study, uh, these are the individuals who are part of our core group. So for our little 25 or 30 person group, we're able to expand beyond that and create partnerships. Um, these are our primary research studies. Today I'm going to I'm going to focus mostly on MedSeq and BabySeq because I think these are the ones most salient to the question I want to ask you today, which is should we be using genomics right away in preventing uh, illness in our patients? And if not, what is the threshold we have to cover in order to start using it? But I'll also touch on some of the projects where we play secondary roles. So for example, we've been designing the return of results strategy for the All of Us Research Program, which is going to enroll a million people nationwide. We have been designing and implementing the return of results strategy for the Partners Biobank, and we have been doing the same for the Google Verily Project Baseline. So uh, there are too many names to really acknowledge, but uh, these are the people we actually are currently uh, collaborating with, and uh, a few people bear special mention because of their central role in our collaborations through the years. I think you recognize most of them. So right now, the clinical use of genetic testing is pretty much similar to the use before next generation sequencing and array-based sequencing was developed and made affordable. And that's the molecular diagnosis of rare conditions, a limited amount of preconception screening, and pre-symptomatic testing for known genetic conditions. Basically, we do this better now than we did because we have access to next generation sequencing and array-based technology. And we've summarized the current use of clinical genome and exome sequencing here in this article that came out in about 2014. And you can see that we've started to add on new portions of this, a limited amount of pharmacogenomic testing, 
uh, a limited amount of prenatal screening, and of course a large amount of targeted therapies for cancer treatment. But missing from this is something that has been alluded to from the beginning of the Human Genome Project. Way back in 2001, Francis Collins and many, many others before and since then have basically said, this is the beginning of comprehensive genomics-based healthcare. It's going to become the norm. It's going to entail early detection of illness by molecular surveillance. And here, 19 years later, we are still not implementing this in the practice of medicine that you and I practice today. And why is that? Why, when you go to your doctor, or if you're a doctor, when you're seeing your patients, do we not have automatically a question of, do you want your genome sequenced, and what can we tell you out of that? And in, of course, it boils down to these three axes, the risks, the benefits, and the cost. And it turns out there's a lot of mythology about risks, benefits, and costs in terms of genomics. And one of the things I hope you'll agree with me with is that we have actually punctured a lot of these myths and started to demonstrate some of the benefits and measure some of the costs. So what is the evidence that we should move more in a more accelerated rate to incorporate preventive genomics into care? Well, to talk about this, one of the things I think is important to realize is that there is at least four categories of genomic information that you want to kind of keep in mind. And it's part of the problem is that we rarely talk about these four categories together. So there's monogenic mutations, which we mostly think about in young children, but which it turns out quite a high percentage of us ostensibly healthy people are carrying. There's recessive mutations, which are mostly of reproductive importance. <clears throat> There's atypical responses to medication, which we can now track through pharmacogenomic testing of markers. And there's the newest area of elevated polygenic risk markers for common complex conditions like atrial fibrillation, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and so forth. Now, I'm going to ask you in your mind to imagine what percentage of you in this room are carrying such a mutation, an atypical response to PGX, or an elevated polygenic risk. Let's just say arbitrarily two and a half times the risk of the people around you. What percentage of people are carrying these markers, and how valuable do you think it would be to identify any of these people in your practice <clears throat> or in your life? Well, let's cover first the myth of psychological distress, because this is one we've got lots and lots of data on. Starting back in 2000, when we, when we did the REVEAL study, which was the first randomized series of trials looking at the disclosure of the quintessentially upsetting piece of information, a probabilistic risk of Alzheimer's disease, we demonstrated that, in fact, there is no increase in anxiety, test-related distress. It's not short-term, it's not long-term, it's not there at all. Not to say someone can't become temporarily distressed, but for those who volunteer for this kind of information, it simply does not exist. People do try to do things. There's a myth of, myth of nihilism as well. People do try to do things with the information, like diet, exercise, vitamins, and so forth, and they certainly say they're going to purchase more long-term care insurance, which is ultimately extremely rational, but very upsetting if you happen to run a long-term care insurance company. <laughs> because this leads to the possibility of a death spiral of adverse selection. And so this has caught the eyes of insurance companies, life insurance, long-term care insurance. For the last 15 years, they have been passionately interested in this area. <clears throat> now, we started that in 2000. And I don't know if you remember what year direct-to-consumer genetic testing launched, but it was 2007. Three companies launched almost simultaneously. So we were just kind of doing this work under the radar, and all of a sudden, direct-to-consumer genetics launched, and it became explosively controversial. What kind of harm was this going to do? Because they were disintermediating genetics experts. We got an entire grant just looking at the customers of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, and I won't take you through all our findings, but there's some really interesting things, particularly in light of newer polygenic risk scores. For example, these direct-to-consumer companies did primitive polygenic risk scores back in 2007 based on the markers that were available then. 
And frankly, those were the markers with the greatest impact. So the polygenic risk scores are much more refined now that we have many, many more markers. But they were actually used and then shut down by the FDA in 2013. We studied, however, how people perceive this information. And it turned out that when they got good news, they appropriately thought their risk was reduced. When they got neutral news, or average risk, they somehow also thought their risk was reduced. <laughs> and when they got bad news, they thought their risk was increased. They understood what they were getting. One of the big questions was, did, were they even understanding stuff? But it was very modest. In fact, all of the amplitude of their risk perception was very modest, suggesting there's a sort of anchoring effect. You walk into any exchange of risk information with a sense of what your own risk is, turns out it's actually pretty hard to move you off that. That's one of the reasons why it hasn't been as upsetting as people have thought to get probabilistic risk information. We also addressed the question of whether people were going to go and break the bank, uh, order all sorts of unnecessary medical follow-up when they got their direct-to-consumer genetic testing. And it turns out that whether you looked at the difference between not elevated risk and elevated risk in terms of diet, exercise, use of supplements, advanced planning, colonoscopies, PSA, this happens to be for um, colon cancer and for uh, prostate cancer, but we looked at this across the board for everything. Virtually identical results with one exception. Turns out that people who go on the internet for genetic testing also go on the internet for vitamins and herbal supplements. So. That's kind, of, uh, that's kind of disturbing, uh, since so much of that is fraudulent. But uh, it was reassuring in the sense that people were not overreacting, neither their doctors nor they were overreacting to genomic information. In fact, the, uh, the uh, FDA was extremely interested, is still to this day extremely interested, in whether pharmacogenomic information delivered directly to participants or customers will cause them to unilaterally change their medication. And it turns out it does not. And there, the world is quite interested, since the companies are always touting this, in whether people will change their health habits. That's a tough one, because people report things that aren't true, and they may not sustain things that they do change. But at least within the first sort of six months of receiving this, at least 30% of people said that they were improving their diet and their exercise. And the remaining 70% did not have false reassurance. They did not reach for the jelly donut when they learned they were at low risk for type 2 diabetes. They pretty much stayed the same. So there is some evidence that people actually, at least some people actually use this as a teachable moment or a motivation or a way of trying to adhere to do things they know they should do anyway. But you know, I've talked a lot over the years about DTC, and I've, I've actually come to the following four conclusions. I think it's done a lot of good in terms of democratizing genomics, demystifying genomics, showing that people can receive complicated information pretty much without harm and without even needing a physician or a genetic counselor. However, it's done some damage as well. I'm not sure it's the same damage you would, you would say, but what I think it's done damage, it's conflated laboratories with providers. Direct-to-consumer companies are laboratories. Sometimes they hire a few genetic counselors. Sometimes they hire a few physicians if they've decided to go around the true direct-to-consumer and get physician authorization. But these are not individuals who are responsible for your care. So they've pitched this to you. They've marketed it to you as provider-based care in a way, but it's really just a laboratory test. And so they've confused the public about the difference between a laboratory test and what it is that we all do, which is taking care of patients, integrating that information into their health. They've also done a great service by universalizing this, these kind of tests, but they've done a disservice because at $99, you get an array-based test that shows you a few markers and does not sequence many disease-associated genes. At the very best, they show you a few disease-associated monogenic variants. So this limited offering and exaggerated marketing has actually diminished the perception of utility of genomics, creating an entire nationwide, worldwide bubble of underestimation 
And that's really interesting because I can't tell you how many audiences I ask, how many people have been sequenced, and a whole bunch of people raise their hand and say, I got 23andMe. When that is, of course, not sequencing, it is array-based marker testing, which you can do for $99. So just moving on now, in the course of this time period, between the time direct-to-consumer was launched in 2007 and today, medicine was accelerating the use of exome and genome sequencing for diagnostic purposes. So if you had a heart problem and we couldn't figure it out and there are a lot of genes that were run, potentially running in your family, instead of sequencing them one by one, we might sequence 60 or 100 or maybe even an entire exome in order to try to find that molecular diagnosis. But what happens when we, when we sequence 60 or 100 or 5,000 genes, we might find something else, the incidental finding problem. We know that problem from radiology, but this is a new problem in genomics. And so for a while, between about 2010 and 2011, the field of genetics was somewhat consumed with how to solve, how to approach, how to even deal with the incidental finding problem. And I was new to genetics at that time. I think I was old enough to have a few gray hairs, but I was too new to have many enemies. So they put me in charge of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics Committee to solve this problem, which was turned out to be a great opportunity and one of the most politi politically charged exercises of my life. <laughs> Fortunately, we were successful, but we had to really think hard about what's the correct model for incidental findings in genomics. Is it like the rest of medicine where you fall off your bike, go to the emergency room, get a chest x-ray to look at your ribs, and lo and behold, the radiologist finds a abnormal signal, wouldn't dream of not reporting it, wouldn't dream of sitting you down before that x-ray and saying, hey, sir, um, before we do this, I just want you to know all the super rare things that we might find. And let's count, let's actually see how you feel about that. Let's count, no. The radiologist goes and reads it and says, hey, there's something in your lungs. Let's get a clinical correlation. And that's the practice of medicine. It's when you look at the skin, it's when you listen to the heart, and it's when you look at an x-ray. Is that the model for genomic incidental findings? Or is it the caution we feel when we hear people shoving people into whole body MRI scans. Now, we don't do that because we know we find incidental lomas too often. We chase them down with surgery, radiation, and ultimately potentially more harm to the patient than we do benefit. So the whole field of genomics has been caught in a tension between these two models of incidental findings. And what we ended up doing in this uh, working group uh, was defining somewhat arbitrarily, but by consensus, 56, and then they changed it to 59 genes uh, for about 24 conditions, which were mostly inherited cancer syndromes, inherited cardiac syndromes, and a few others that we felt were ultimately actionable, where if you knew that someone was at increased risk for this, you would definitely want to do something about it. At least we would. Now, there's still controversy about this, which we'll talk more about. But this has stood remarkably long. Uh, we came up with a list in 2011, published it in 2013. Uh, they revised the list slightly in 2016, and really, rather sadly, have not revised it further, even though there are clearly many other genes. Uh, Andrew Stragakis is working on this with us in the biobank. Clearly, other genes and other conditions for which there are obvious well-established, uh, actionable uh, courses of action. So again, at the same time all this is going on, the cost of sequencing is coming down, and large-scale sequencing for research is going on. Now, this is in clinical care. This is like, I got 100,000 samples, and I want to sequence everybody. And this became the coolest thing on the block. And this started really with the UK Biobank in 2006 and the Vanderbilt Biobank in 2007. They got this started, and they have really led the way in, in our country and around the world. And so these, this confluence of effects started to influence the way biobanks begin thinking about return of results. Now, interestingly, UK Biobank and Vanderbilt have resisted return of results to this day. 
But subsequent biobanks started to get influenced by the fact that 14 million customers had done DNA. And it was really democratized. And it started getting people into the idea that they should get their DNA. There was an evolving ethical standards, paper after paper, hundreds of papers about the what we owe to participants in terms of return of information and what they have access, what they should and must have access to, both under HIPAA and also just in terms of ethical responsibility. We cannot underestimate the Angelina effect in 2013, which dramatically increased awareness for BRCA mutations. And then our report at least gave people a list that they could point to and gave IRBs a list that they could point to. It was never meant to be a screening list, but it by default became the only sort of list out there. So all these factors combined so that large-scale genomics studies started deciding they must return something. Now, this really interesting phenomenon, because IRBs sort of went from complete skepticism and resistance about returning results to requiring it with no time spent in equipoise. It was a remarkable transformation. Even our own partner's IRB has now virtually will not allow gene, gene sequencing without some sort of plan to address this. So this has now moved us from a kind of opportunistic secondary finding or incidental screening to a kind of population screening in the sense that you pick a population that you've enrolled for research and you now, as part of the research requirement, you give something back. And the, the sort of world leader in this has really been the Geisinger MyCode experience. They returned the ACMG 59 plus a few. They've uh, consented over 260,000 participants as of this month. And they have returned um, results to about 1,400. <clears throat> but think about that. In the entire world, this is the largest experience in returning a list of 76 genes. So what could we do to look more deeply? Well, we've run into a lot of debate about this. And the, there's a lot of things discussed, a lot of public health focus. But the arguments on each side sort of distill down to these three, four, and against. For population screening is the diagnosis of unsuspected genetic disease, the possibility for risk stratification and surveillance and even prevention, and the idea that if people want to know about their genomes, they should have the right to know about their genomes. And even if it's not treatable, it's, it's, it's an empowerment, it's a right to know. They can find personal utility in that. The arguments against are largely public health uh, arguments, which are quite important. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how they play out with the evidence. And that is that since these are often rare conditions with a low prior probability, you could identify many people who you declared them to be at risk, but they never developed the disease. It's really hard to prove the value of clinical utility and cost effectiveness since this would amortize over not just months or years, but decades. And we don't tend to get funded for that long. And there's the huge problem of inadequately prepared workforce. So when we thought about population sequencing, we tried to ask ourselves, how can we really dive in and study this? And our answer was the MedSeq project. The MedSeq project, uh, and this came out of my background as a clinical trialist, was very, very simple concept. Treat genome sequencing as an intervention and examine it in a randomized clinical trial. But not just the idea of 76 genes or 59 genes, but what is the entire value you could get from a genome if you spared no expense and used the absolute best possible interpretation pipeline you could construct? And then what would happen if you gave that to a primary care doc, several of whom are in the room who are part of this study? What would happen if you gave that to them, instructed them on how to use it, but didn't even bother with a geneticist or genetic counselor? I mean, that was heresy. Give this directly to a primary care doctor and then let them loose on the patient with a safety net. And that's what we did. And so we randomized trial with just a, a good family history as the control, a family history plus a comprehensive whole genome sequencing and report as the alternative. And then we looked very closely at quantitative measures of all the outcomes we could possibly think of. Now, there was not even a construction of how to do this. A lot of this major grant we spent creating a pipeline 
for what we thought would be a truly valid variant interpretation. And this has become rather standard in the years since then. But we published this in 2014, and it's been a template for companies and academic centers all over the world to do this. And it basically is what you'd expect is a combination of computer algorithm to get the, the five million variants that each of you carry down to a couple hundred. And then best practices, unfortunately, is still a manual curation which goes into the literature and talks about the variants that you're finding and sees which ones truly meet criteria for pathogenicity. And there are a lot of reasons why this hasn't been fully automated yet, which we can talk about. Uh, but, the, but the truth is it hasn't. And so first we set that in motion. Then we decided, well, how do we give this to primary care doctors? And we created a one-page report. Now, it's not very fancy. It's not a colored dashboard or anything. But it, we trained up a bunch of primary care docs on this one-page report where they got to see what kind of monogenic findings, what kind of recessive findings, what kind of pharmacogenomic association. And we really did a lot with this. We looked at 5,000 disease-associated genes, 5,000. And we looked at all the markers we could actually get out of this and basically tried to give you everything you could get in the theoretical value. By the way, there was no evidence of anxiety in this, as there has not been in any of our trials. Not only were sequenced people no more anxious than control people, but the people who learned that they had a monogenic dominant variant were no more anxious than the people who were sequenced and did not learn that information. Well, here's what we found. And this is part of the problem. It's a collection of one-offs. It's a collection of rare conditions. And no one clinician, with the possible exception of uh, a generalist in, in genetics, is prepared to talk to people about any of these that they get. So you've got to be prepared in a medical system to manage these one-offs if you're going to do something like this. But here's the crazy, crazy part of it. And here's the answer to one of those questions I asked you at the beginning. We found that 20% of the ostensibly healthy volunteers for this study were carrying a monogenic dominant mutation for a monogenic disease. Think about that for a minute. That's, you know, that's everybody from here to the left. That's incredible. Way, way more than you'd imagine from childhood genetic clinics, childhood diseases or any previous conceptualization for that. And here's something else that was quite remarkable. When we did DNA first, and we found these individuals, this is, by the way, I, I like to subtitle this talk, The Power of Small Data, because you can't do this with 100,000 people. We would call them back in, circle around, and then using the DNA finding as a guide, look for the phenotypes or the clinical tests, laboratory tests, that indicated the presence of disease. And in about a quarter of these, we found them. We found abnormalities that clearly signaled that the disease was not just a potential. It was already there. This is a different conceptualization of DNA than at least we in genetics have been thinking about. It is DNA as a first step in the diagnosis of a previously unrecognized, non-symptomatic, or clinically under-recognized condition. We also looked at whether the primary care docs made serious errors. We actually audio taped every conversation that they had with their patients. We transcribed them, and then Joel led a review of this entire thing. Turns out that there were errors they made, but they were not serious ones. We were able to quickly give them feedback, and we now have experience training primary care docs to give this kind of information. And you should have seen the confidence that they gleaned. The first, first couple of transcripts were really awkward and hesitant. And by the sixth or seventh one, they were just sailing along as if they'd been doing this all their life. You know, you don't need to be a chemist to interpret a clinical chemistry report to somebody. You don't need to be a physicist to interpret an MRI report. And you don't need to be a geneticist, as long as you've been trained up on the report, to interpret and return genomics findings, at least to a certain level. We also were the first to measure costs within a randomized clinical trial format. And we've demonstrated that although people do end up paying more for costs uh, when they get genome sequencing, it is not exorbitant and it is appropriate. 
So again, there's been a tremendous amount written, speculatively, about whether sequencing is going to be breaking the bank, is going to rob the medical commons. It just doesn't seem to be so, at least in the hands of this admittedly non-representative group of primary care docs who were not told what to order, who were given freedom to order what they wanted. Here are the cost curves of the individuals who were on the control side and on the sequencing side. Here are the individuals who found monogenic disease risk. And there were lots of other things in there, as you remember, but you can see that it certainly wasn't clear that there was tremendously increased risk. Each person actually had an orthopedic injury, and so uh, <laughs> hence their cost was very high. <laughs> we were also the first to ask the question, or at least document the question, which a lot of people were asking, which is, science is moving along all the time. How often should you reanalyze your genome? I mean, the genome's done pretty well now. It's not like you had to get it resequenced every couple years. But after an average of two years, 22% of the variant classifications had changed. Now, fortunately, they hadn't changed drastically. Often they'd gone from uh, likely benign to benign, or likely pathogenic to pathogenic. Uh, but a, no, a few had changed dramatically. So if we're going to put this into play in the practice of medicine, we're probably going to need to re-up this. Uh, that's not a, a new idea. You don't use th the, uh, CBC from three years ago to evaluate a patient now. But uh, it does mean that we have to think about this as an ongoing, at least in terms of interpretation. Well, if you think, if I've, if I've even gotten you to think at all that this might be good for you as an adult, then the question is, wouldn't it be better for you as a child? Because you've now got a much longer runway to determine risk and disease and help you understand and, and, and your risks and avoid them. So we pushed the envelope a little farther and got funding for the BabySeq project, a completely new and separate randomized trial of sequencing in ostensibly healthy newborns, absolutely healthy babies who had nothing wrong with them by virtue of the pediatrician, and who were examined, in this case, beforehand by a geneticist to make sure we didn't miss something that would have flagged them as a genetics baby. All of them passed that. And again, what we found is that the percentage is slightly lower because the IRB would not let us return fully adult onset conditions, even though almost all the families wanted that. But even not returning now, going from 5,000 genes down to about 1,800 genes, 11% of these ostensibly healthy babies had a dominant mutation in a monogenic condition. Again, about a quarter of them, when we circled back, actually had unsuspected features of the disease. It starts to feel a little creepy. What are we missing out there that we could have discovered if we had tested people's DNA. Again, just building the lily here, uh, there's, a, every, there's been volumes written about how we should never do this in children because it's going to disrupt parent-child bonding, increase perception of child vulnerability. It just isn't so. The randomized trial methodology allows us to look at this among volunteers, and it's certainly people are quite comfortable getting this information, as they would be with other things. Led by Kurt Christensen, we've been looking at healthcare spending. And again, the genome sequencing arm does spend somewhat larger, but arguably for proper value. It's not a question of whether you spend more. It's a question of are you getting the kind of value you should out of the spend that you're doing. And because this am amortizes over a possible lifetime, it's simply not sufficient to measure costs in the first three months or six months or 12 months. You've got to start taking modeling here and try to model best practices of whether these would amortize over a lifetime. And basically, you can project 230,000 per life year at the present, but with certain projections, costs coming down, more automated interpretation, you start getting down to 100,000 or 70,000 for quality, which starts to be the threshold that public health professionals say makes this worthwhile in terms of cost effectiveness. So we are really approaching the point, if, if you believe these models, where this is, meets our current thresholds for cost effectiveness. Well, 
what is it like in real life to actually talk to people and give them this kind of information? It may seem a little intimidating, but I want to show you a little bit of what we've done in the Partners Biobank, led by Scott Weiss and um, with our, our ROR program led by Kerry Blout and Emma Perez. And we've got people who had both chips, uh, chip array and also gene sequencing. We went ahead and just looked at the ACMG59 because there was limited funding to do more. We, we wrote to them, we called them, we resampled them because this original sequencing or, or chip data was not clear. We then communicated the validated result and we made sure they got to the place where they needed to go. And what we found is that over 370 people actually had pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in the ACMG59. That's, this is several hundred people in our own patient community who happened to volunteer for the biobank. We did reach about half of those by phone. Interestingly, even when we reached them and said, you have a finding that might be of medical significance in your DNA, would you like to know it? About 20% said, no thanks. And they had different reasons. They're older, they don't have a lot of family members, they're, they're working with some other health problem. But I love this figure because it says that people have agency, it says that people can say no, it says it's not coercive to call people with a piece of information and say, I found something, do you want to know it? So this is really important, 20%. But we did return to people, and they were universally, universally grateful. And this has made a real difference in their lives. And by the way, you don't get this from standard criteria. Of the people, for example, who met pathogenic, likely pathogenic criteria for 15 cancer predisposition genes, 55% had not discovered this by any other means already. It was not in their uh, medical record. And when we called them, they had never done it outside their medical record. And about half of the ones who were not in the medical record met NCCN criteria. They'd never been tested even though they met the criteria, and the other half didn't even meet the criteria for testing. So not only are those who meet criteria for testing not getting picked up, but those, there's a lot of people who don't meet those criteria, and you're missing them all, if, even if you were able to execute perfectly on this. A couple of patients I want you to hear from. Uh, let's see if the sound comes up. I'm 62 years old, in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, which is up by the New Hampshire border, and I'm a software engineer. I was um, in Mass General for heart surgery in 2014, and uh, someone, I don't remember exactly who came to me and asked me if I wanted to be part of a genetic study, and I said yes. Yeah, so I got a phone call, and they found something in my DNA, and they wanted to do an another test to confirm what they found was correct. So I got a spit kit and I sent it in and I uh, met with Dr. Green and he told me that I had Fabry disease. Since I've already had um, heart disease, I was surprised and intrigued that it could have been related to Fabry disease. I learned that Fabry disease is an X-linked uh, disease and that my daughter has a 100% chance of having this gene variation as well. So when, my, when I told my daughter, um, she was definitely interested and she does want to get tested. She's a, she's a, very, she's a single parent and she has a very busy life, but uh, she, she will get tested and I do believe she will. I'm glad I learned uh, from myself and I also learned that there are new treatments, some very recently that have been developed and uh, it felt good that when uh, I told my daughter that she would also be able to avail itself of these treatments. Interestingly, he had heart disease, now in retrospect, probably due to Fabry disease. And when he signed up for the biobank, the treatments for Fabry disease were not even there yet. So he, if, you had, if you had sort of drawn a bright line about what was actionable at that moment in time, you would not have even chosen to give him this information back, which is one of the problems I have with the whole notion of actionability. Here's one of the subject for my baby. So I am Lauren Stetson. This is my daughter, Cora. And we enrolled in the BBC project about three years ago when Cora was born at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We were not really hesitant about the study because we really wanted to know as much as we could about our daughter, but we were a little concerned that if we did have a result that would be life-altering, how we would go about 
our new parenting style or what we would change about our lives in order to give her the best life that we could. Cora was originally flagged for biotinase deficiency on the newborn screening. We went and had her retested by her primary care physician. The results came back normal. And then about two months later, BBC called to tell us that she was in the group that was tested and she did have biotinase deficiency, but it was a partial. We went to a genetic counselor at Boston Children's Hospitals where they tested her and her enzyme levels were low and so they provided a vitamin supplement. She takes her medicine every day. We talk about it as a family because our five-year-old is very concerned as to why he does not get medicine also. <laughs> but he gets yogurt if he, if he wants. She takes it in her yogurt every night after dinner and she knows what it's for and why she does it. So we are grateful that it can kind of help our entire family in a way that we didn't really think about in our initial approach. I think that information sometimes can be daunting in the beginning, but it's always better to be more equipped with as much information moving forward as you can have versus being in the dark. I'm not going to show each one, um, but here's a gentleman who knew he was supposed to be getting colonoscopy starting at age 50. Uh, hadn't done it, because like a lot of us, we don't want to really admit when we reach that threshold. Um, but uh, a, an APC he found, and multiple precancerous polyps were found when he now was stimulated to get the uh, colonoscopy he should have Brian, what? And then uh, a wonderful woman with uh, PRCA2 mutation who decided to get prophylactic surgery uh, on the basis of the BRCA2 gene and a, uh, an active cancer in situ was discovered when she did that. So um, I'm not cherry picking these. These are, uh, this is, this, these are people who were willing to talk to us, but they, the, the response has been extraordinary. Uh, for people who, who they signed up for Biobank uh, and it did say in the consent form, we might contact you if we find something in your DNA. But it wasn't like they were in-depth consenting. And they, they responded very well. So um, we, we took the, pro the uh, biobank protocol, and we are now um, helping to apply it pretty much as we do it here within the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative uh, run here by uh, uh, Beth Carlson and uh, Jordan Smoller, which is attempting to bring in a million people uh, nationwide. And um, this sort of brings us to the end where I guess I want to circle back and ask you now, does this make you want to get sequenced yourself or be more likely to offer this to your patients? If it does, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that the more genes you look at, the more higher the percentage of people, at least with monogenic dominant conditions, you're going to find. So some people have defined the CDC tier 10, which is BRCA, Lynch syndrome for colon cancer, and, and uh, hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and if you just look for those 10 genes, which might be a good way to start, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, you're still going to find positive mutations, unequivocally positive mutations, in 1.3%. Same here, same here. You can see you can get close to 3%. If you just go up to 147 genes, I'm not sure it's quite that high, but Invite has reported uh, over 13% positive. And if you go up to what we did in MedSeq, BabySeq, and uh, a study I haven't told you about, the first study of sequencing in the active duty military, which we uh, won from the Department of Defense, you, you consistently see between 15 and 20%. So one last thing, though. What about polygenic risk scores? This is a new hot topic. And I asked you to estimate what percentage of people you thought might be two and a half times more likely. And here's the best evidence. Uh, this is not our work, but the work from colleagues around the country, um, which is that 20% for coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, and lesser percentage for type 2 diabetes, prostate cancer, breast cancer. This is non-monogenic non breast cancer and non-monogenic colorectal cancer. Again, do you think it would be valuable? to identify the people in these slices and focus additional information, focus additional attention, focus additional uh, effort on surveillance in them. I think most of us think it would be. So then the question is, how many people carry at least one of those? Look carefully. I love this slide. And it turns out that half of this audience is carrying 
higher than 2.5% in at least one of these six conditions. Do you want to know? Do you want to know that for your patients? I don't know. I, I kind of do. So, um, <laughs> so uh, after um, two years of um, stealthy bureaucratic maneuvering, uh, we got uh, support from uh, the division and the department and the entire Brigham to start the country's first preventive genomics clinic that offers sequen comprehensive sequencing to healthy adults and their children. And I want to thank everybody for this, but especially for Joel, who's been plowing the ground <laughs> with us. Uh, it's a lovely space, thanks to uh, Shelly Anderson and, uh, and uh, David uh, around uh, innovation. And let me tell you what we've done so far. Uh, we've got a bunch of clinicians who signed up to see patients. We actually do, uh, we want to be conservative here. It's not like MedSeq where we're pushing the boundaries in research. We actually do meet with the genetic counselor. We do a physical exam, which is different from direct to consumer. And we give people a menu. And this turns out to be a wonderful educational experience where they're given a couple of vendors that with different numbers of genes, with different panels, and different price points. And it really allows them to drive home the question, wind up music. Um, it really allows them to understand some of the strengths and limitations of what they're getting. And so uh, we announced this just, a, just about six weeks or a couple months ago. And already, we've had contact from over 134 individuals uh, coming from the media, from the Brigham website, from word of mouth, from some of the presentations we've given, and from other providers. Um, and these are some of the reasons why they are referred. Now, this is really interesting. Some people have a personal history of disease, so it's really indication-based testing you want to move them into. Some people have a family history. Depending on what that is, you may want to move them into indication-based testing. And some people are truly healthy genome. Of the 40 or so we've seen to date, it turns out that 12, or a big third of this, actually did get diverted into indication-based testing. And that's important because we do different thresholds for variant classification if it's indication-based versus when it's clinical. Or, uh, so how often are you going to learn something important? So this was the question I asked you at the beginning. And I've kind of given you the answers along the way, right? 15% dominant. Mutations. You may or may not believe that, but that's what we found in three different studies. Um, we talked about 50% uh, of you with a polygenic risk over two and a half times that of the person sitting beside you. And here's the rest of it. 91% of you carrying a mutation for a recessive condition, which could be important if your partner is carrying a mutation in the same gene, right? Because you're rolling the dice in terms of the potential that your child will have a terrible effect of disease. And there are reproductive technologies to address this now. And then 80% of people with an atypical response to pharmacogenomics. So I want to wind up and give us a few minutes for discussion. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak here. There's a lot more detail where this comes from. Over 200 actual peer-reviewed manuscripts that have been published on, on the, the data that I've shown you. But I think this is a good overview to whet your appetite. And on behalf of the entire Genomes for People program uh, and their families, uh, we are so thrilled to be here and to be presenting this to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was uh, very, very provocative. And it's a good sales pitch for genetics in clinical medicine, wonderfully presented. So. Um, I want to start uh, the questions with a discussion of uh, enumeracy. You know, the, uh, everyone knows what, uh, what illiteracy is, but enumeracy is far more prevalent in a, very, in a very verbally versatile population, such as exists around Boston. And conveying these complicated messages to patients of all stripes of education and such level really requires a lot of subtlety and insight into how they receive it. That's true for us as physicians as well. Um, for example, you emphasized the fact that a quarter of those variants that you observed that were not 
at least initially, observed phenotypically, but were subsequently. Of those, three quarters had no phenotypic abnormality. I would prefer to emphasize that segment. And it really gets at the issue of penetrance, probability, and how you convey those complicated ideas to even a well-educated patient in a way that you believe they can make an informed decision. Well, I 100% agree with you. Um, we have a innumeracy in the population and innumeracy in our providers. So everybody's pretty bad at numbers and statistics. But you know, in the rest of medicine, we don't get but so hung up on that. So if you take a moderately elevated cholesterol, I think the odds ratio of uh, your risk of heart attack is like 1.67. Sit down and say to people, let me talk to you about the difference between 2.5 odds ratio and 1.67 odds ratio. We say, you've got an elevated cholesterol, let's, let's treat you, let's focus on, on, on this risk factor. I would say that the, that, that the quarter that we saw that are symptomatic, it's almost too late. Uh, there's some data that I didn't show from Framingham Heart Study where we followed, well, we, we retrospectively looked back over 20 years at people who were DNA tested. It was a very small set, uh, less than 100 people. But 80% of them had developed the condition uh, of, of uh, indication by the DNA by 20 years. So the problem of penetrance is really a problem of narrow focus of traditional geneticists who see somebody as a child or see somebody as an adult and then lose them after a year or two. Nobody follows these people for 20 years, but people are interested in their health over the next 20 years. So uh, although the data is not there yet, what data there are seem to suggest that penetrance is higher than we had imagined if you follow it longer. So given that, and the fact that in general practice of medicine, we don't get hung up on statistics, I would say we treat genetics more like regular medicine. Sir, you have an increased uh, risk of colon cancer. Let's make sure that you are following best practices for increased risk of colon cancer in terms of your colonoscopies. Ma'am, you have an increased risk of X, Y, and Z. Um, it may not be treatable now, but let's get you uh, into a research project where you can be monitored. I think that this is what we do with the rest of medicine, and this is what we should be doing with genomics. Other questions? Yes. So I'm wondering if there should be a push to have a pool of data, multi-center, multi-national biobanks, for instance, that can provide that to 100 million or 300 million for better predictive algorithms uh, in public domain assets. Absolutely. And that is in large part what all of us is designed to do. It's uh, in part what the UK Biobank has already done. It's extraordinarily expensive. It tends to be something that only nations take on. Um, but at different levels, genomics is sharing databases often more successfully than any other realm in, in medicine. Critically important. Yes. Super important question for those of you who might not have heard. Uh, the question is about underrepresented minorities and polygenic risk scores. Uh, it's absolutely true that the inferences from polygen around polygenic risk scores from Western European populations do not translate accurately for other ethnicities. However, in general, they don't tend to be directionally different. They tend to be uh, directionally the same just the, they're not as accurate. That's important because when you do focus groups with underrepresented minorities and say, would you rather have risk information based on Caucasians or would you rather have no risk information at all, which at this moment are the two choices, they almost always say, give me the risk information. I understand that it's not going to be as accurate. So it's a major problem, but I just don't think it should be a paralyzing problem. Um, it should, we should absolutely address it. In fact. We just got a supplement to sequence, to do elective sequencing on African Americans and Hispanics. We're writing a new grant to NCATS uh, this week to try to expand BabySeq out into underrepresented populations. Um, there's some fierce resistance to this. There's a funny way of thinking if you're um, 
if you feel like you're an advocate for an underrepresented population, there is such a loaded history in terms of eugenics and um, abuse uh, in terms of genomics, abusive concepts, that uh, often people just don't even want to see you go in that direction in an experimental basis. I've had grants that have been pushed back just saying, you shouldn't be doing this. It's like not a scientific reason. You just shouldn't be doing this. And so that's, that makes it tough. Yes. About embryo testing. That's right. Well, look, I mean, I like being on the cutting edge, but um, we all we all dr figure out where we draw the line for for and and I like to think that we're doing it with a safety net in an NIH approved way with IRB approval on all of our studies. Obviously, this company is actually growing up embryos, looking at polygenic risk scores, and allowing customers to select embryos on the basis of this. For me, that's a, that's a little bit too far at this moment in time, um, because I'm not sure the benefits that they would glean from selecting those embryos is um, appropriate for the risks they're taking in taking otherwise healthy people through IVF PGD. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that's a good idea at all. But it, it, there's no stopping this. You know, people are going to be selecting embryos, they're going to be editing embryos, and the sooner we dive into this with our entire medical workforce and make it part and parcel of what we do every day, the sooner we're going to be partners in this, advocates for our patients, <coughs> breaks where it's inappropriate, and cheerleaders where it's appropriate, rather than bystanders, which is what we are right now. Most of the medical establishment are bystanders to a revolution that's going on in commerce and in other parts of the world. Well, that's a great place to end. Thanks very much, Robin. Appreciate yeah, thank it. You.